Well, good morning, June 1st, and uh, finally, I think 100 degrees are here to stay. I'm Matt Allen, along with my good friend Dave Riccio, and we are Bumper to Bumper Radio every single Saturday at 11, right here on KTAR. And Dave, I'll tell you what, we haven't done a show together in, what, five weeks or so? Oh, I'm going to be picking on you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's been a while, and it feels good to be back with you. Uh, You know, Bumper to Bumper Radio is a show for you, the listener. We're here helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience. Whether it's a car purchase, finding a shop, a little do-it-yourself project at home, we're here for you. So if you've got questions, we've got answers, just get involved and give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, we are announcing the winner of our Bob Bondurant School of High Performance Driving Giveaway. We gave away, or we're going to give away, a teen driving experience. We had a ton of entries by email at bumper to bumper and uh, but you didn't win if you haven't entered. So, got to got to. That's one way to stay involved with the show and uh, be a winner. And how to be safe working on your car. Uh, you know, we had uh, had a little accident this past week, and and uh, somebody lost their life. So we're going to talk about the things that you can do to be safe. And Dave wrote a blog about that, and it's on the KTR website under the bumper to bumper tab. And oil change intervals always a hot topic. Uh, when, like Jill said, when are you supposed to do it? Uh, it's a question on the show almost every week. I'm in the business, and I think I am totally confused. I've heard three thousand. I've heard th- uh, 5,000. I've heard 7,500. I've even heard 15,000 from one of the oil makers saying, man, this is good stuff. 15,000 miles. We're always talking about how the rules have changed about auto repair. The way your grandpa told you to do it is not the way you fix your car anymore. And the oil change is a big one that people don't know. So we went from every 3,000 miles, got to change your oil, got to change your oil, got to change your oil. People did that religiously. And then we've had automotive manufacturers say, ah, you don't really need to change oil that often. And some of that, you know, environmentally, oils have gotten better. We don't need to be pouring all that oil down the drain or whatnot. You may pour it down the drain, Dave. Well, I don't pour it down the drain. (laughs) I don't want the EPA coming after me. We recycle it. But uh, so oil... Oil change intervals have gotten bigger, but they're not 10,000 miles, 12,000 miles, 15,000 miles, as some of the manufacturers make claims to, which I, I'm, not, I'm not crazy about. Well, they've changed for several reasons. One, because the oil has gotten better. The filters have gotten better. The cars have become more efficient. You know, we're dumping all this extra fuel that we're not burning down into the cylinders. Well, that ends up in the oil or in the crankcase ventilation system. So... So the efficiencies of the engine have gotten better. The marketing departments sure have gotten better. Way better. And the other thing I noticed, there is a little light that says I've got 50% oil light left. That didn't used to be a thing. You know, you used to have to, that oil change sticker was all you had. Now you have that reminder. Is that the is that the Bible? Do you go by that? Well, and we'd like to hear from you, all those who are driving around and all of you that are listening that have cars. Look up at that sticker that should be on your window and see what it says your oil change should be done. And look at your odometer and see how many miles you have and if you're over. And, and, you know, maybe we'd like to hear what you do or what questions you have. And uh, you can you can. Get involved at 602-277-5827. But Dave, again, we talked about the marketing arm. I worked, I, my last job before I opened the shop, I was a technician at Camelback Porsche Audi. Did I, you have hair then? I did have hair then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. But I hadn't worked on many Audis because I always, you know, I worked other places and worked at Porsche Specialty Shop and, and, and whatnot. But I get this service and I go cha- do the oil change. I call an oil change an oil and oil a filter. And the, and the service manager's like, what are you doing? You're just supposed to change the filter. Mm. What are you talking about? That feels well, weird. Yeah, big time. Top, change the filter and, and add some oil. Well, that's not how they do it now. But that was marketing from Audi. You don't need an oil change. You just need a filter. Now you take the same Volkswagen engine and the same Audi engine, and we work on a ton of these, one manufacturer, Audi, says change it every 10,000. The same exact engine is in, is in a Volkswagen and change it every 5,000. Is that because it's different oil? No. I think the filter's different on some of those. Some variation, but yeah, that's but a huge difference. It's marketing. 
Well, I think if I'm a consumer and I'm out there, I come to the counter at Virginia Auto Service. And I say, hey, Matt, I just bought this car. It's a 2012 Toyota Camry. What do I need to do for oil changes? What is your advice at the counter of Virginia Auto Service going to be? Well, I had a customer the other day who had a brand new car. It was the first oil change, and she came in. She's like, oh, I'm past due. I'm at 3,500 miles or 3,700 miles. I need to get that oil change. I said, no, don't, let's not do that. You don't need to do it as much in this car. This car wants a synthetic or a semi-synthetic oil. This one happened to be a GM product, so we'll go, go away from the Camry for a second. As a GM, they require a, a special, I'll call it special, it's not so special anymore, a Dexos certified, it's GM's oil. And uh, I said, no, let's, let's, it's not due yet, but your light's not on either, but we're not going to wait till the light comes on. I want to do that oil change every 5,000 miles, 5,000, 10,000, 15, 20, 25, 30. Then you always have, for me, you have the sticker, but then you have that right. even number. It's just something you just remember. Just go with it. Every 5,000 miles, I'm going to go see you, and you're going to take care of my car and let me know what I need to do. Well, I printed up a couple different ones. Okay, but Dave, I will say one thing, though, real quick. That light probably maybe, depending on how you drive the car, there's a map or a program that – Somebody has written based on number of cold starts, how long you, how much temperature gets in the car before you turn it off, sh- length of trips and frequencies. That oil change reminder or that life cycle may go to 0% at 7,200 miles, 8,400, maybe 4,700. I don't know. But it's not actually measuring the quality of the oil. No. There's nothing, no little sensor in there taking a it's sample. Just a prediction. Exactly. Based off of what the engine has experienced. This is what we're predicting is the estimated percentage of oil life left. So I went ahead and just printed up four different vehicles. I did Cadillac Escalade 2011. I picked all 2011s. Honda Element 2011. That's because that's what I drive. Uh, And then I went with a Toyota Camry 2011. And really, there's obviously a normal service timetable. And there's a severe service timetable. And you really got to look down at the fine print. And what we really want you to do here after listening to this, go look in your manual. See what it says. And don't just read the numbers. You got to go down and look at the fine print to see what the difference is between severe and normal use. I pretty much say Arizona severe. You know, you and I, you say, well, we're only really hot half of the year. It's super dusty here. And I think that's tough on oil. Well, and I think we'll go off tangent a little bit. We're severe all the time for oils and fluids and filters. We talk about timing belts. I think some people are overdoing it when they tell you your yes. 105,000 timing belt is due at 60 because yeah, we're that's severe. Yeah, overkill. Big but, time. But, yeah, so we – again, that's why the relationship with your shop in, in knowing when to deviate. But, but like you said, Dave, get in the owner's manual, and you always want to do at least the minimum. And not – and it just came to my mind. We didn't talk about this earlier, Dave. Not just the owner's manual, but – you know, how many times have you had an extended warranty denied because, oh, lack of maintenance. You didn't do your maintenance. I don't care what the manual says. Our guidelines safe to to make this warranty stay in force. You have to have an oil change every 4,000 miles or whatever. They don't care what oil you use. When I, we started this show, I said 3,000 miles. We all got married to that. Well, on this Cadillac Escalade 2011, it's still calling for an oil change every 3,000 miles in the severe service timetable. That's the Cadillac. The Toyota was every 5,000 miles. The Honda was every 5,000 miles. There's one other I pulled here that I can't find my notes on. But uh, 5,000 miles, somewhere between the three and 5,000-mile mark. But what I don't want to see is people going 10,000 miles. Well, no, but, you know, now you have your higher-end cars. Uh, BMW, for example, that's another one that we see a lot of. BMW, Mercedes, they have a large oil capacity, 10 quarts in some cases, 12 quarts. I say, we use liters on those cars, but <laughs> I don't know. But the they have system. an extended drain interval. They use, like I said, they use a lot of oil. They have a very good fleece filter, and they're letting the car go fifteen thousand miles. But we're seeing a big difference between the cars that we tell the customer go to the dealer for your free one because they come with four years of maintenance. Let us do the in the middle oil change. We'll do it every seventy five hundred. Mm. The cars that we're seeing coming out of warranty are having a whole different set of problems than the cars that we see that we've changed the oil because the oil is carrying acids and, and uh, you know, all other kind of contaminants that 
that, come from the combustion process. And they work on the hoses and they contaminate plastics. And then don't forget about E85 if you're using that in your car. That's a whole other story. So, so when we come back, we're taking your calls at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen. He's Dave Riccio, and we're Bumper to Bumper Radio again every Saturday at 11. And it looks like we got a hot topic going today with oil. It always lights up the phones, but uh, we've definitely got time to help you. And don't be shy. Please give us a call at 602 277 5827. And you don't, it doesn't need to be about oil. You know, you've got all kinds of other questions, and, and just ask Dave. He knows everything he can, <laughs> he can, can help you. Well, this last week, uh, my church family lost a, lost a, a loved member uh, from working on their car in their driveway. He was under the vehicle. He had it supported by a floor jack, and the floor jack let loose. He was all by himself. His family was inside watching TV and uh, pretty much died on the spot. I mean, he was the hospital. They kept him alive for a while. Uh, but uh, working on cars is super dangerous. You know, when I heard the news, I was like, oh, man, you know. I remember all the close calls I had, you know, growing up working on cars before I actually learned what I was doing, and it is dangerous. And I would say the number one is raising a vehicle and getting underneath it. I mean, we're not saying don't work on your car. Right. We're saying if you're going to do it, be careful. Careful. So raising the vehicle was our number one. And uh, in the blog, a couple other ones that I touched on, uh, fans and fan belts. If the engine's running, don't put your hands anywhere near, you know, open hood or the engine compartment. Uh, anything rotating, you're going to lose a finger or well, worse. And if you've got your hands in there digging around, get the keys out of the car. Someone might want to go in there and have all well intentions. Your buddy decides he wants to listen to the radio. Start it up with your hands around. Bam. Around. Or maybe you've got the remote start on the alarm. The other one, and this is a, this is the most common mistake. As soon as people's cars overheat, they pull over, they lift the hood, and they think, well, what do I do? I'm staring at this engine, and they go to open the radiator cap. Big mistake. You are going to get scolded if that car's overheating. So, is it, I mean, as soon as you relieve pressure from the system, and it comes out of there like a volcano. So radiator caps is another one where I see people get hurt. And then batteries. Uh, batteries do blow up. So they off-gas a little bit of hydrogen. And with a little bit of spark, you know, if you arc something, bam, the thing blows up. So whether you're changing a battery or you're jumping a car, you got to be careful. I always recommend safety glasses for that because you're going to get an acid bath if that thing blows up. You don't want that stuff in your eyes. Yeah, no fun. So please, if you do it yourself or even not a do it yourself or just jump starting your car in the parking lot, just please be careful. A little extra, yeah, because it happens quick. So don't want to be a downer on it. Let's get to some calls. What do you think, Dave? Craig from Mesa calling in his 1998 Honda Accord. Craig, what can we help you with today? Hey, gents. I've uh, a little bit of an issue where I have an, a check engine light that keeps coming on. Had it checked at a Honda dealer. They said it was my catalytic converter. I had that checked out by a muffler company, and they said, no, it was my O2 sensor. All right, so I have that done. I get my emissions done in April, passes. Two weeks later, the engine light comes back on again. Um, low gear, it uh, stalled a little bit. Uh, I did put a rebuilt transmission in it about 100,000 miles ago. But at idle, you can see the RPM gauge just kind of dance. So it tells me it may not necessarily be the transmission. What do you think? Well, you said the check engine light came on again, but what you didn't say is what the fault code was the second time when it came on. Is it still a catalyst problem, a catalyst efficiency problem, or an oxygen sensor related, or do you know what the code is? I, I don't know what the code is. I, I took it to a Pep Boys, and they said that if they couldn't, their sensor, their diagnostics machine wasn't working. And they, so I took it somewhere else, and they said they don't show it to be the catalytic converter. So... You know, I, I told them specifically what people have said, but don't have any specifics to it. There's a, to me, it always seems like we get, we get a lot of questions where people are concerned with the engine idling, that when it's idling in gear, that they see a lot of movement. You know, the engine's just idling rough a lot of times. It really doesn't have any effect on the transmission other than when it's in gear, drive, or reverse. You're putting a load on the engine. So if it's idling rough in park and then you pull it in a drive, you're just going to drag that idle down a little bit lower. So as soon as the computer sees the idle come down, it's going to feed 
it's going to feed more fuel or air to get the idol back up. So right. you can see it go up and down, fluctuate. Right, true. But, Craig, there's a couple things that you said that, that I really cued in on. One, we don't really know what the, what the fault code is. So it's prob- it very well may be nothing to do with the color converter or, or any of those repairs that you had done, too. But you always hear Dave and I preaching the relationship. And just in this, with these couple problems, it sounds like you've had your car to four different places and you're getting tidbits of information, people that don't have the right equipment. I think you need to find a home, a place to take your car where they can handle everything for you. And I see you live in Mesa. You should go to bumper to bumper radio.com and look at the map and see who's close to you. Maybe see who's close to where you work. I know in Mesa, Lee Weatherby at Acura Automotive is a, was a Honda technician forever before he opened the shop. Good choice. Mesa Auto Works. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of shops there that can help you. But find a home, and then that way you, you just you know where to go and you feel good, and they'll help you through this process. Well, one of the problems is there's a lot of advice out there about cars, a lot of advice, some good, some bad, you know, some terrible. There's yeah. a lot of terrible advice out there about cars. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're working with a good qualified technician or, you know, repair shop, you're not going to get bad advice or steer wrong. But you can spend a lot of extra money doing a lot of things you don't need to do off of bad advice. So diag- it needs to be diagnosed. And that's my point. Nobody wants to do that. They don't want to pay for that. It just, it just doesn't seem doesn't feel good. But that's the best money you can spend. Well, but I don't think it's not that he doesn't want to pay for. It. He just well, doesn't know what to just. Well, I'm not yeah, right. Yeah, right. Right. I got I'd you. But, okay. but go <laughs> find a home, Craig. Find maybe, a home. Maybe you shouldn't come back. I was it was better without you. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the call, Craig. It was a good one. And Don and Chandler, we're going to help you with your 2000 Toyota Avalon. What can we do for you today? Well, um, I, similar to the previous caller, I, I have a check engine light that keeps coming back on. Um, and I'm not sure what the codes actually mean. I do have the two codes that came up when it was red. It was red uh, two days ago. Okay. Um, and after I left the shop, it came back on. Um, it was P0325. Uh, it was a knock sensor circuit bank uh, code. And then a P0420, uh, catalyst system efficiency below threshold. And I'm not sure what that even means or if it's a uh, serious um, error or if it's a, a serious code or anything that, uh, that needs to be looked at right away. Well, cat efficiency codes are pretty common. I think you start okay. to, you see these older vehicles, and there's there's going to be a couple of O2 sensors that are reading the quality of the exhaust coming out of the engine. There's uh-huh. one, one that reads it before the catalytic converter and one that reads it after. And the computer is going to measure the difference. And when it doesn't see enough difference, it's going to say, hey, we, get, we might have a problem with the catalytic converter and its efficiency. So that's what that code is in relation to. Now, it's okay. interesting on this Toyota, I do want to make a point. When you see a Toyota with a knock sensor code, a lot of times you won't have fourth gear. A lot of people don't know that. They're driving their car first, second, third, no fourth gear. So. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so maybe check and see if you're get, getting all the gears. But the other thing, the catal- or the knock sensor problem could be causing your catalyst efficiency. Knox is a byproduct of the combustion process. And the, what the knock sensor does, that listens for knocking or pinging. Uh, and, and it will control the engine. The engine control computer will retard the timing or back the timing off. And if that's not working right, you could be overloading the catalytic converter with NOx, and it's not liking that, so that could be causing the low efficiency there. So the 325 problem could be causing the 420 problem. And we can talk when we talk a little bit more about using the right fuel to Take help with carbon problems, which create NOx if the engine is not running right. When we come back, we're going to be announcing our winner of our Bondurant giveaway. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are your KTAR car guys, helping you with your car every Saturday from 11 to noon right here on KTAR. All you got to do to get involved is give us a call, 602-277-5827. 602-277-KTAR. And I just got a text from Joel Bartko from Arizona Import Specialist, and he says, man, he works on a lot of BMWs, and I know you do down there at Virginia Auto Service. And some of these cars have a 15,000-mile oil change interval, and, and the car's like low on oil by the time you get in at 15,000 miles because the car is using oil or consuming oil. Which is normal. Which is normal. I mean, a, a normal amount to that. So 
that could be a little scary. You know, in, before the show, we're talking about higher mileage cars. You may treat a car one way for the first 50,000 miles, 75,000 miles, but as the cars get more age, you know, you should consider a more frequent engine oil interchange or change because the car needs to be seen more. Well, I don't know how many of those high mileage or high high interval drains type of cars, BMW, Mercedes, Audi that we've seen in the shop that didn't make it to the next oil change because something failed in the middle. Something failed prior. Yeah, you've got it. Maybe the car had 75,000 miles on it, and now it's going to go to 90 all of a sudden. Boy, there's a lot of things between 75 and 90 that could go wrong. Uh, recently, we had a little BMW 3 Series wagon. The belt pulley system came apart, but it didn't. It, it broke in a way where the it didn't shred the belt, but it was still barely spinning the water pump, barely spinning the alternator. She didn't have any other symptoms really until she blew up the car. But I'll tell you what, a 7,500-mile oil change at a good shop, we would have seen that, and she would have not had a, a toasted engine. Well, here's, here's my rule of thumb. Everybody wants a rule of thumb for what the oil change should be. And I'm saying go read your factory owner's manual. I don't believe everything in there, but it's a good place to start. And I would say in most cases, no less than what you find there. And if you live here in town, it's the severe timetable, not the, not the normal everyday driving timetable. This is Arizona. It's hot here, and it's dusty. And dirty. So up for this segment, we are going to go with, looks like, Fisher in Goodyear on a 2002 Ford Expedition. Go ahead, Fisher. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. How you doing today? Good. I got a problem with my Expedition. Uh, I let it sit for too long, and the battery had died. Then when I went to recharge the battery, it wouldn't fire, and it wouldn't turn over. Did did you get the battery? Do you know that you have a good be, good charge yeah. in the battery that's got enough amperage to to turn the engine over? Yeah, it's a brand new battery. It's in the state. I even had it checked out, and uh, it it turns, it turns, it turns. It just won't fire. Okay, so it cranks, but it won't start. Well, how long did you have it sitting for? About three and a half months, four months. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that shouldn't be enough to turn the fuel nasty, nasty or anything yeah. like that. How much fuel is in the tank right now? Do you know? Three quarters of a tank. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, we've got to figure out why it's not starting. We've got to have spark. We've got to have fuel. We've got to have compression. You didn't lose compression by sitting there. You could have lost some electronical component. Uh, you know, maybe the security system, if it's got a pass lock type of security system, could have got a little freaked out with uh, with the dead battery you know, for so long, maybe the fuel pump, you know, it, it, somebody needs to check it out. You need, like I said, you have to be able to test for spark, fuel, fuel injection, right. pulse. But one thing you might try doing, maybe the fuel pump, the little motor in there, they just kind of stop in a dead spot sometime before you have the car towed in. Just go shake the truck side to side and get the fuel sloshing and bouncing around in there. I mean, hey, Dave, you're giggling, but <laughs> I'm you, laughing because you guys should see Matt actually yeah, doing, I'm doing this. The, the, the talking. visual, like I'm, I'm the Italian. I'm the one supposed to be talking with my hands. <laughs> well, you know, but we have cars sometimes get towed in the shop, and you just go smack the bottom of the gas tank with a rubber mallet. Then goes to working, and they start working. So. Give that a shot, but otherwise, uh, bumper to bumper radio dot com. There's some uh, um, good S- shop. S and S tires a good 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 shop for Goodyear. So, thanks so much for the call, Fisher. We are going to go with looks like Phyllis in Chandler on a 2006 Kia Sorento. Go ahead, Phyllis. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Hi there. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. Yes. Um, I've been uh, listening, and I have been neglected as far as looking at my owner's manual, I guess. But um, uh, I had, I have had this uh, Kia since 2006. And um, I've been try. I try to keep up, you know, with the oil change and so forth. And uh, the last one was at fifty five thousand miles, and I've got fifty six eighty five on it. And I went over for uh, they called it a um, uh, customer service clinic, and uh, they put on here that uh, I need to uh, recommend front and rear brakes, and. Uh, I thought the price was kind of high, two twenty nine each, and then they said the timing belt was four hundred and ninety nine dollars, 
and spark plugs, three hundred and seventy-five thousand, uh, seventy-five thousand, uh, seventy, three hundred and seventy-five dollars, and a lower intake, the plenium leaking, and that in parentheses war- warranty. So um, my question would be is. Uh, um, when they put this down, if I don't get this done with them, is that um, going to make my warranty um, val- um, valid? Or it will, No, it won't hurt your warranty at all, Phyllis. And I think what you need to do is you need to go get a second opinion. Um, in Chandler, if you, if, if you're, if you do email and want to send Dave or, I, Dave or I an email, we will get you a personal referral and personally get you in contact with the best shop close to you. And you can do that at bumper to bumper radio.com. But if you can't do that, you're in Chandler. Start with Greg at ADS automotive diagnostic specialties. A couple things that you said, you're at 55,000 miles in your 2006. You don't need a timing belt yet. I don't know what the interval is. It might be 60,000 miles on that car. I know in some of the Kias, and they were a little bit older, those belts would get lost really close to 60,000 miles. But I'm kind of thinking on that one, it's not. I was trying to look it up while you were talking, but I I just can't operate the keys fast enough. The price of your brake jobs sound too good. Well, they're they're, they're pretty, pretty low, actually. But that's kind of a... Uh, I would call that, and I don't know where you went, but they, I'd call that a loss leader. They're going to advertise low prices on a couple things, uh, but then when you're not looking on some others, maybe get you. And then uh, always on the timing belt. That 499 is probably just the timing belt. And my concern there is, depending on how you use the car and what the change interval is, the timing belt should be replaced with the other components. doesn't sound like you drive the car a whole lot, but I think you definitely need a second opinion. I'd love to get you directed to the best shop for you, uh, but start with ADS and Chandler. Go in, schedule a time with them. They'll take the time to sit down with you, review your paperwork, find out how you use the car, and I think that's the best thing for you. And then the other thing, they will direct you. If there's something that's under warranty, Believe me, they will tell you, and they will help facilitate. Well, yeah, that. and that Kia, that that uh, leaky intake would definitely be covered. That's something you want to get get handled, right? It's and a- and at the same time, though, Dave, if they're going to have the intake off under warranty, those spark plugs that need to be replaced right are staring you in the face, and it takes them no time to do. And you don't want to let them double dip on you and have all that stuff taken apart and then charge you full price to do the spark plugs either. Well, Phyllis, thanks so much for the call. We are going to go with Martin in Chandler on a 2002 Toyota Camry. Go ahead, Martin. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Uh, yes, I have a 2002 Camry. I have 245,000 miles on it, and I was told that I have an, an evaporator leak. And I don't want to, with the mileage and it's the original transmission and engine, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to spend $1,000, $1,200 to, uh, to put an evaporator. Do you have any suggestions on to seal that leak or anything like that? How many miles run that again? 245. Oh, okay. But how's it running, though, and have you taken care of it all that 245,000? Uh, yeah, yes. The only thing I kind of slipped up on was changing the transmission fluid. I think we've talked to you before maybe a year ago. You sound familiar. You know how I know that? Because he's on my on-hold message asking a question about uh, should I should I service a transmission or will I put it into shock? Did you end up servicing your transmission? No. You did not? No. Well, I, I, are you at a point where you're ready for a new car, Martin? Or uh, Well, I'm, it's getting to the point, yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, if, if my the air conditioner doesn't, uh, you know, I'm not going to get it fixed with that, you know, with that kind of mileage on a car. But I was what I'm trying to find out is there any way I could use some kind of sealant to go in and plug that? Uh... No, there really is no shortcut around the evap system code. It's gonna you're gonna have to get that fixed. No, I think he's talking about the air conditioning. Oh, evap. the air conditioning. Not, okay. Yeah, probably what happened is, is and Martin, it's not a sign of the times with the car. I wouldn't be afraid of it. You would be surprised at what your 2002 Camry is worth and the kind of life that you're gonna get out of that. Just spend a thousand bucks and fix the car. The, I mean, if you go to sell that car, what's it worth with no air conditioning? 
nothing. Nobody wants to drive that car. So even if you wanted to sell it or go trade it in and, and, and maybe you think it's time to buy a new car, you're going to get nothing for it. You could spend $1,000 on the air conditioner, drive it through the summer, and not have any concerns or, or and most likely not have any problems. And that's why I asked you about how you've taken care of the car. If the, if the car is not falling apart around the air conditioner, uh, you, you fix the car and, and, and you'll get some good life out of it. But if you absolutely just hate the car and you're tired of it and you want to treat yourself to a new car, then by all means, go buy a new car. Yeah, but well, why mess with the old one? But, uh, you know, you can barely get sales tax on a new car for three, 4000 bucks. I mean, so <clears throat> the reality is if, if you don't mind driving it, Stick with it. So we're going to go with one more here before the break. We're going to go with Brian on a 1989 Ford Escort. Go ahead. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, thanks for giving me a call. I got a problem with uh, my car won't pass emissions. It's dumping fuel in the throttle body. And whether it's idling or you're going down the road, it's like... When you're sitting idle, it's doing like 55 miles an hour. With the... But what I did was the ignition switch wouldn't work. So I put a new ignition switch in it, everything else. You know, when it started, I put a starter button on it, jump the solenoid. Is the brain picking up? Am I bypassing the brain or what? Uh, no, bypassing putting a button on to overcome the ignition switch just for the starting problem is yeah. is, is not that starts go- fine. Yeah, it, that's it's just is dumping fuel. Yeah, that's not going to have anything to do with with the uh, with the starting. The computer couldn't see that, but those ignition switches have a problem falling apart. So the 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 concern is that you might be affecting something else, not just the ability to start the car. Power to the computer, or power to the module. But you also said if that thing's going fifty five miles an hour, <laughs> of course it's dumping fuel. So. Uh, you, you need to find a shop in, in again in, in in Avondale SNS Tire that's right up their alley. They have, would have no issues fixing that. It, it's just something that's going to need to go into a shop. No starter button and no getting around that one. Hey, thanks so much for the call. 602-277-5827. 602-277-KTAR. And we've got a Bondurant giveaway. We had uh, It's a teen driving school. And uh, we had a lot of entries come in through Bumper to Bumper Radio as well as on our Facebook page. And it's going to be Travis Stevens. Is We've got an 18-year-old listener. We've got some young listeners. So uh, congratulations, Travis. And uh, get a hold of us through Bumper to Bumper Radio.com, and we'll get that to you for sure. And uh, if you are thinking about a teenager that's getting ready to drive, and, man, you don't want to even think about teaching them to drive yourself, Bondurant School of Driving is a good way to do it because they're not going to listen to you anyway. Plus, they're going to well, t- <laughs> yeah, your kids aren't going to listen to anything you have. But at least they can go out to Bondurant School and have fun doing it and learn. Because we can't teach our kids and you can't teach your kids the stuff that they're going to teach them, get them in an environment, and get them in the zone, so to speak, where they're really going to be focused and have some good takeaways. It is nice to have Bonner right in our backyard. So when we come back, 602-277-5827, you are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are here helping you with your car. All you got to do is give us a call at 602-277-5827. And Matt's over here on the computer. I think he's looking up service intervals for Phyllis's, it was a Kia Sorento, I think, uh, that she, he was looking at spark plug intervals. So what would you find, Matt? Well, I haven't found them yet. I haven't got up to, I, I mean, it doesn't look like they're due at 60,000 miles. So um, I, I was looking for timing belt, too, and, I, and I'm, I'm at the 60,000-mile mark, and I'm not seeing timing belt on the service interval either. So I'm going to go up in the 100,000-mile range, and, and uh, ooh, there's spark plugs. Nope, not even due at 90,000 miles Well, yet. Phyllis, I certainly hope you can send us an email at bumper to bumper com, and we can look up all that information as well as get you personally introduced to Greg up at Automotive Diagnostic. We're going to go to Tim in Gilbert. Looks like he's on a 2004 Silverado. Go ahead, Tim. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Go ahead, Tim. Hello. Hello. Yes. How you doing? Good. Good. Yeah, I've got a 2004 Silverado. It's the uh, diesel. And it seems like I have a problem with fuel pressure. Uh, and 
if I put a load on there, the engine, I just do a nosedive on it. Now, I can open the hood and repressurize the system there by the fuel filter. Uh, I've changed the fuel filter, uh, and I'm still having the same symptoms. And, and the symptom is, you're falling, is it a starting issue, or it doesn't, or what was it one more time? Uh, it just, uh, I think it's a fuel pressure problem because uh, the engine just, uh, it'll, it'll run fine, it starts fine, uh, but uh, it, sporadically it will just uh, die on me, or not die, but it'll, 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 it'll feel like it's running on about four cylinders instead of eight cylinders. Does it, is there a check engine light or service engine? Check, check engine light comes on uh, about a year and a half ago. I uh, took it into a shop, and they said they diagnosed it as uh, um, uh, that some wires were chafing, you know, to a couple of the uh, injectors. So they redid that wire harness on two of the cylinders. Um, but then I had the same uh, same problem uh, several months later. It and it seems to be worse in the summertime and than it is in the wintertime. In the sure. wintertime, I didn't have any problem with it at all. And as soon as it started heating up here, then. Uh, uh, once or twice a day, I'll be driving down the road, and I'll just, you know, uh, it'll lose all all the power. Uh, like I say, it feels like you're running on four cylinders. Sure. I'll stop the truck. I'll turn it off. I'll go to the uh, uh, gas filter where you can, you know, prime the filter. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll pop it uh, nine or uh, eight, nine or ten times. Get right back in it, start it, and it drives fine. Okay, I had an 04 Silverado, the Duramax, and I did have a problem. And I had to replace the wiring harness in mine. They just shake and vibrate around and rub enough, and 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 that can certainly be a problem. We need to find out why that check engine light is on again. Uh, it wouldn't be uncommon to have bad fuel injectors in that truck. Uh, the other thing is that there is on that model, I believe that the fuel filter housing becomes porous on those, and they start sucking in air. So you're gonna you're gonna get air in the fuel system, and the diesel is not gonna run right. Also, depending on what kind of smoke is coming out of the tailpipe on that, it is is will tell a lot of the story. So you may want to have that for your shop. On um, if you don't have a shop or if you're not comfortable with the one that's been working on. It, Again, we're talking about ADS, Automotive Diagnostic Specialties in Chandler. They are a Bosch Diesel Service Center, and that is right up their alley over there. There's not a problem with them fixing anything on that that truck. But it needs to get in and get a diagnosis done and find out what's going on. Hey, thanks for the call, Tim. We are going to go with Rick in Scottsdale. looks on a, like a 2008 Nissan Titan. Go ahead, Rick. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, um, I'm looking at uh, upgrading my, my muffler to a performance muscle or something other than stock, other than OEM. And, uh, and I'm looking at the Maglipo 50 compared to, um, uh, I guess, Flowmaster, I guess, is the other one. Um, is, is one any better than the other? Just making, trying to make the truck breathe a little better? Um, I would. I, I would. Have you been on any Nissan forums to see what people like? Because some of that may be personal preference between the Magnaflow and the Flowmaster and wh- which one people are liking for that truck. Hmm. Well, I have, and they're, and they're, you know, it, it just seems to be personal preference and 50-50. I was hoping that, uh, you know, if you guys had any, any insight, or, or better yet, even if you had a, um, uh, I guess you're going to say go check the website for um, a location to go to to, to go ask uh, a muffler shop around, uh, around Scottsdale, North Scottsdale. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know of a muffler shop in, in North Scottsdale. Uh, I think muffler shops are kind of... Uh, dying out a little bit, but you're fewer getting, and fewer. But you do have Scottsdale Muffler, who's uh, right right at the 202 and the 101. Yeah, but, for me. Yeah, he's up, he's up north. I mean, there there are some there are some. I think you're going to get your best information by going on the internet and looking at the forums. You can probably look at the performance data. I certainly don't have any data to even form an opinion. Uh, or not even without any data, I, I couldn't form an opinion. You you might just search. You might find some people think others. Some are noisier than others, which you may or may not like. You might find it changes the torque range. Maybe they've got some dyno specifications. And I think you're going to get your best information online, just it, from other people that have done it. Yeah, you and, know, guys like this or like that, and maybe meet somebody that's got. Talking to some guy in the parking lot. Hey man, how do you like your muffler? Well, but but I mean, yeah, or or just you know the performance shops. The uh, 
Yeah, I think the best information is going to come online. You're probably going to want to get a nice, clean, bolt-on kit and then find a shop that that will bolt it in. Most shops don't like to use customer-supplied parts, but I think on a custom item like that, if it's honest, it's a nice, clean install where it's it's made for that truck, and it, it, you won't have a problem finding that. A performance shop would be a good fit for something like that, for sure. So thanks so much for the call, Rick. Oil changes. So what is the takeaway for our listeners, Matt? Well... Uh, don't let the marketing arm of the manufacturer uh, totally influence how you're going to change your oil. Use a good oil. We didn't talk about good oils. Go to your owner's manual, and that should at, be the minimum, at least the minimum. Uh, but I think in, in certain cases, you need to cut that down quite a bit and talk to your shop about it, ask questions, and ask them why they make the recommendations that they make on oil changes and then follow that sticker that's in the window if you didn't get a chance to give us a call or didn't want to get around to it you can send us an email with your oil question or any question really at bumper to bumper radio.com if you don't have a relationship with a shop and are looking for one we can certainly get you started there uh so anyway uh, the winner again on that bond Rant challenge was uh travis stevens we'll be back next week remember never text and drive